Good afternoon, everybody, and Happy New Year. Well, we're back two years later from the pandemic starting. Can you believe that? And we're going into 2022 with all guns blazing. So what I wanted to do for you was um, to repeat what we've done. Um, you know, I think it was about uh, this time last year, we had Tom Simmons from Deloitte's a colleague of Peter's to come on and just give us a sort of indication of what was happening last year, because it was very uncertain at that time. I wanted to do exactly the same and get um, all our readers and and, uh, and audience uh, a little bit more of an update on what's in store for 2022. So delighted that P Peter Erickson from uh, Deloitte and the e uh, economic, um, I can never say that word, uh, team is here to give us a full update on what you feel is happening on the jobs industry. So thank you so much for welcoming or for joining us and giving us this update and making the time. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me along uh, to, to speak, uh, Wendy. Um, so, yeah, as um, as Wendy says, um, my name is Peter Ryerson. Um, I'm, I'm an economist. Um, I work at Deloitte. Um, we look a lot at the at the UK economy. Um, we advise clients on uh, macroeconomic conditions, um, and also um, we publish the, the Deloitte CFO survey, um, which is a quarterly survey um, of some of the largest businesses in the UK, um, and assesses their, their investment intentions and how they feel about the economy and, and how they see things evolving. Um, I mention that because um, it's something that I'll, I'll touch on in my presentation. Um, we launched our, our most recent one um, last uh, last Monday. Um, so if I just um, share my share my screen. And then That's great. Can... So just before you get started there, um, okay. uh, uh, Peter, what I was going to say is that this will be a slightly different crowdcast, but I think it's really relevant. So the audiences, please feel free to post any questions or let me know in the uh, um, either in the side panel or in the question side. And um, because normally we would just be chatting through, but I think when we're talking about stats, visual is my game. So you've prepared a nice presentation for that. So um, fire away if you want to share your screen, but please, audience, I know that you'll be sort of um, just wanting to see what's happening, but post any questions and we'll be able to pick them up at the end as well. Thank you. Uh, sorry, two seconds. I just okay. seem to have lost my presentation. Oh, there, there we go. No, it's disappeared again. <laughs> I do, I do apologise. Um, That's all right. I know it was there two minutes ago, so. Um, if you just share your, are you able to share yeah, your I screen? Share, if I share my screen, hopefully rather than the... You now, perfect. And then you can just present mode. Awesome, we're off. So, perfect. Oh, brilliant. So this, the, slides, the slides are up. So, um, yeah, so in this uh, sort of brief presentation, um, I wanted to touch on uh, sort of two main things. So the first is just a little update on how we see the, sort of the economy at the minute and some of the big economic themes. Um, and then also only something that would be relevant to what you um it's just some thoughts um, on the labor market um as, as we see it as, as economists um but i'd be very interested to hear if you know this chimes with, with what you sort of see in the labor market or, or not um so starting with um the economy then and um, big development in the last couple of months i'm not I'm sure you'll be aware is is, is omicron um and you know, as, as we all know we've seen an explosion in omicron cases um, but we see you know, fewer hospitalizations um, and, and, and deaths in, in comparison to that, to that level of cases. Um, and we've uh, certainly in, in, in England, um, we've, we've, not, we've not gone back to a full lockdown and, and gone for, for more minimal um, restrictions. Um, that's not to say it's, it's had an impact on the economy. So just sort of two things I'll, I'll share here. And um, so on the left, um, this is some data from, from Google, um, which looks at the, the number of visits people are making to different destinations. Um, and what you see there is right at the end of, of 2021, there's a real drop in the number of people visiting the retail and recreation destinations. Um, and that's not so much um, due to restrictions, um, but it also reflects actually that the consumers are cautious. Um, when, when they read in the news about um, high cases, um, they, they take steps to, to, to minimise their risk. Um, and that's, that's hit um, certain consumer-facing businesses quite hard. Um, so on the right, and we've got some survey data from the Office for National Statistics. And they've been asking businesses uh, for a long time, um, you know, how is your turnover relative to, to what you'd expect at this time of year? And actually, even before Omicron emerged, lots of businesses were quite downbeat um, about, um, about uh, their level of turnover. What was really interesting um, was that um, once Omicron emerged, there was two sectors which saw a real jump in the, in the number of businesses 
reporting and filing turnover. Um, and those were accommodation and, and food services um, and administrative, administrative and support service activities, um, which is a little bit unclear, but it, it, importantly, that includes um, uh, sort of travel agencies um, and, and travel businesses. So those two sectors have, have been very badly affected by, by Omicron, um, even as the rest of the economy um, has, has continued with, without the disruption that we've, we've seen in previous waves. Um, just to touch a little bit more on sort of outlook for the corporate sector, there's two features um, of, this, uh, of this pandemic and this downturn, um, which, which surprised um, us as economists. Um, so on the left, we've got quite a long running series um, showing the number of UK companies insolvencies, as these are new companies going, going bankrupt. Um, and what you can see is there's a real spike both in the early 90s, uh, during, during the early 90s recession, um, and also in the late noughties during the global financial crisis. Um, economists predicted that we see a similar spike um, during the pandemic, um, but due to the extraordinary levels of government support that we saw, um, bounce back loans, grants, um, tax cuts, um, etc., and there's actually a fall um, in insolvencies below sort of normal um, normal levels. Um, and the outlook for that, there's, there's a survey of the Bank of England, which, which asks banks, um, you know, how, do you, how do you see your loan portfolios um, changing? Um, and the good news here is that the banks don't expect a, a rise in, in insolvencies among large businesses, um, but among small and medium-sized businesses, um, they're still expecting to see um, an increase um, in, in insolvencies as that um, support is, is withdrawn. Um, just to touch quickly then on, on sort of growth and, and inflation, um, and so we saw a very strong uh, recovery in, in activity um, throughout the sort of latter part of, of 2020 and, and early 2021, um, but that has been slowing um, as the recovery becomes, um, becomes more mature. Um, the other factor that's been, has, that's been weighing on growth, of course, is um, it's the emergence of inflation, um, not least to the sort of supply chain disruption that, that we're seeing, which is both weighing on growth um, and also stoking inflation. Um, and so on the right, um, the right here actually, uh, what, I've, what I've included is this is a series, it's the average inflation rate among the OECD, which is a club of typically uh, rich advanced economies. Um, and that's, that's hit a 25 year high. Um, you have seen, um, lots of you have seen this morning, um, that in, in the UK, um, inflation has hit a, um, has hit a 30 year high. Um, in the US, it's reached um, 7%. Um, Central banks actually in the UK, um, the US and the Euro area, they've got a target that inflation should be around 2%. Um, so we're clearly a long way from that, um, a long way from that target. Um, and this, this really has taken economists by surprise. Um, it's certainly not, uh, not what we were predicting um, uh, you know, 18 months, uh, 18 months ago. Um, and, and I'd just like to sort of briefly touch on you know, why this is. Um, so sort of two, two um, Two main factors. So one is that uh, commodity prices have risen very quickly, and in particular energy prices. Um, so you may have heard about uh, you know, the pressure on, on UK energy prices. On the right here, we've got a chart of um, electricity and gas prices. Um, so the, the gas price, this is the front month contract. So um, for delivery of, of gas in one month's time, um, sort of equivalent to the spot rate. Um, and that's risen from around about nine pence per firm, um, peaked at around about 4.50. It's now about um, 190. So um, even now you're looking at around about 18 times increase um, in the cost of gas for um, almost um, immediate delivery. Um, further ahead, the price of gas um, is, is lower. Um, so for delivery at, in, in later later in the year, um, but it is it is rising and it is elevated above normal levels. Um, and of course, this is um, this is feeding through uh, total inflation levels. So not only have we seen a rise in the price of, of gas, but also in, 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 in petrol and diesel. Um, inflation is calculated by looking at a basket of goods, um, goods which people spend more on have a, have a greater weighting, um, and gas, um, road fuels. These, these are significant um, pieces of expenditure for, for many households. Um, and on the left here, you can see that the price of, of petrol and diesel is up around about 27% from a year ago. Um, the price of, of gas and electricity is up around 23% uh, from a year ago. So these are rising much more quickly than, than the rate of inflation overall um, and dragging up that, that headline number. Um, the other factor, of course, that's, that's hitting that inflation um, is supply chain disruption. And to illustrate this here, um, I, I 
I've got uh, something on the, on the price of, um, of particularly second-hand cars. Um, so there's been a real disruption to the supply of new cars. Uh, people are buying second-hand cars instead um, as they have to wait a long time for new cars. Um, and also there's been a slight secular shift in that some people have decided they don't wish to use public transport during the pandemic um, and they'd rather, you know, rather, use a, rather use a car. Um, and so the, the price of second-hand cars, again, is up nearly 30%. Um, in the US, it's nearly 40%. We're seeing this around the world. Um, and again, second-hand cars, a lot of households running a car, buying a car, significant um, expenditure. And so it has a high rating in that, in that headline rate. Um, so that's a, a little bit about um, sort of what's going on in the economy. Um, so I'll move on um, quickly to the, the labour market um, and what's going on um, in the labour market. Um, so for us economists, one of the biggest sort of headline statistics we look at uh, for the labour market is unemployment. Um, and I thought it'd just be really interesting to note, going into this crisis, um, we as economists predicted that there would be a real rise um, in unemployment. So on the left here, I have some forecasts um, from the Office of Budget Responsibility. That's the government's um, public finances uh, watchdog. Um, and you can see there's a uh, there's a light blue forecast here. Um, that's what they thought was going to happen before the pandemic. Uh, the news of the pandemic emerged um, by July 2020. Um, their scenario slightly different to a forecast, but they saw it as a, a as a plausible um, a plausible case for, for what could happen. Um, they predict a huge rise in, in unemployment um, up to around 12 percent, much higher than in the global financial crisis. Um, by later that year, they have cut that forecast and were feeling, feeling much more optimistic. Um, and then what actually happened, of course, is, is, is the black line, so the, the outturn. Um, and actually, we've, we've seen a modest, um, a modest rise in unemployment. It's certainly not reached uh, the levels that we saw in the global financial crisis. Um, and it has been falling, uh, falling quickly. Um, you may have also um, seen that the number of payroll employees in the UK, so this is um, compiled by HMRC, um, they look at um, how many people are on uh, PAYE, um, pay as you earn, um, and this fell again at the, at the beginning of the pandemic. It's actually surpassed its, um, its pre-pandemic peak. Um, so here you have two very good pieces of news um, for the labour market uh, showing it's, it's very strong. Um, I'm going to just talk about some of the bits of bad news, however, that we have seen in the labour market. Um, so although the number of employees has risen, um, we've actually seen a very large fall in the number of self-employed. Um, so since the beginning of the pandemic, there's approximately um, 800,000 fewer people um, in self-employment. Um, now, why this is, is not completely clear, but three, three reasons have sort of been floated um, among economists. Um, so the first is that um, in, in a time of uncertainty, um, there's more security in, in having a, a permanent job as opposed to being, being self-employed. Um, the second reason um, is some of the tax changes around self-employment. Um, so I'm sure some of you will be familiar with sort of IR35, um, disguised employment tax changes, which have, which have hit a lot of uh, freelancers um, and contractors. Um, uh, and also actually the, the government has said throughout the pandemic that it's looking to change how self-employed, um, the self-employed are taxed to align that more with how um, the, the employed are taxed. And that perhaps might be a reason uh, for the change. Um, and the final reason is possibly um, throughout the pandemic, some of the support for um, people in employment was possibly slightly more generous than, than those in self-employment. Um, I know in uh, for self-employed, uh, there was a, a fairly low cutoff um, for um, the support. And if you're above that cutoff, you, you, you got very little support. Um, so these are all possible reasons um, that people have been moving out of self-employment um, and into employment. Um, the, the, other, um, uh, the other factor that's been uh, hitting the um, sort of supply of labour um, is that we've seen a, a slowdown in, in migration. So the data on this, um, there are problems with the data, we're not completely sure what's going on, um, but what we seem to have seen certainly is a slowdown um, in the number of EU workers um, coming to the UK since uh, the referendum in, in 2016. Um, and this, uh, this, this is, is likely to reduce um, the overall um, supply of labour. And actually, during the pandemic, uh, we saw the numbers of, of EU-born workers in the UK uh, falling. Um, 
Um, so, although yes, as I've said, there is some positive news on, on the labour market, so I think unemployment, um, there is still some slack um, in, in the labour market. And, and this is worth thinking about when, when we're talking about you know, is, is the labour market running very hot? Um, so the first piece of data I, I, I wish to share is actually, if you look at the total number of hours people are working, um, this is still uh, well below uh, pre-pandemic uh, pre levels. Um, and why is this? Uh, well, in large part, it's because the inactivity rate has risen. So um, economists talk about the inactivity rate. Um, so these are people who are out of work um, and also not looking, uh, not looking for work. Um, so they're not uh, to be unemployed, to be out of work, but looking for work, um, to be inactive, to be out of work, and also not uh, not looking for work. Um, so this has risen um, quite uh, quite sharply um, during the pandemic, um, and has yet to recover to its uh, to its pre-pandemic uh, levels, which actually were uh, much lower than we saw um, throughout much of the last uh, last few decades. Um, now, why why is this? Why have we seen this um, rise in activity? And so this is a chart that, that breaks it down. Um, and the biggest single reason, actually, that we've, we've, we've seen a rise in activity um, is more people have gone into education. So um, we saw this in the global functioning crisis in 2008, um, that with a very uncertain labour market, it's not a bad move, perhaps, to go to university, uh, to do a master's, uh, to, study, to study for a few years, um, and then hope that by the time you finish that qualification, uh, the labour market will have improved. Um, and your and your prospects um, will be better. So that's certainly part of the reason. Um, we've also seen quite a, a large rise in this other category. So um, people ask, well, you know, why why are you not uh, looking for work at the minute? Um, and, and and they give a sort of unclassified reason. Um, and and what uh, economists think this might be is that actually people are concerned about contracting COVID in the workplace. So there's perhaps some some hesitancy um, among among workers to to return to work. Um, given given those fears, um, the other factor we've seen in this um, uh, in this downturn, which we, we didn't see, um, well, two, actually two other factors. Um, so one is that we've seen an increase in people, a number of people um, saying they're not looking for work due to long term sickness, um, and perhaps although it's, it's not quite clear, people have speculated um, that this could be due to people um, suffering uh, long long COVID. Um, finally, one thing we've seen in this downturn. We again didn't see in 2008 um, is a negative contribution um, from people who say that they are looking after family um, or home. So this means that throughout the pandemic, people have been moving um, from saying they're out of work as they're looking after their family or their home into work. Um, so this, this group have been moving um, on in aggregate um, into work. And I think part of the reason for this is that actually you know, there's been a change in attitudes um, to flexible working. So many people may have found it easier to keep working um, from home around their other commitments, be that uh, family commitments, childcare commitments, um, caring commitments. I and mean, actually this is reflected in the uh, differential labour participant labour participation rates among men and women. So you've actually seen very strong um, participation from, uh, from women, uh, uh, more, more than we would have expected. Um, at, at the beginning of this um, of this pandemic. Peter, um, I'm just going to stop you actually on that slide because I find this slide really interesting and I know the audience will as well because essentially when we are competing um, to try and get talent and there's not enough candidates, you know, this really maps out the sort of segments of the market that we've got to try and understand to try and get them back into work because essentially, you know, we're, we're complaining and all the recruiters are complaining right now is they just can't get enough candidates. Um, and I always find that really interesting when candidates decide to go back into university because I just think, well, you're kind of delaying the inevitable because in three years' time, you're going to be coming out with everybody else and the market isn't going to have the same demand. So, you know, it's it's um, it's a really interesting picture that it, it sort of paints in terms of where we can find the candidates and move them into the labour workforce as well. So thank you for sharing that. No, that's, that's, that's absolutely right. I think you know, what, what you can take, take away from this is uh, you know, students, um, you, you've seen a rise in students, um, perhaps also some people with fears about, about returning to the workplace, mm -hmm. um, but also that flexibility um, and being able to offer flexible work means you can attract candidates um, that you would would not previously have been able to do. Um, been able to do. So, um, yes, yeah, so I think certainly for, yeah, for this audience, some, some really interesting messages there. Mm -hmm. um, 
Um, so yeah, that's that. What I've given you just then is sort of an overview of labour lead supply. Um, so I talked just a little bit about uh, labour demand as well. Um, so the, the main sort of measure of this is, is vacancies. And we've seen this sort of explosion um, in vacancies to um, well above uh, pre-pandemic levels. Uh, so well over 1.2 uh, million um, uh, millions of vacancies and confirms jobs. Um, there's also some data from the, uh, the website and Hanzuna. Um, so this looks at how adverts for different uh, different jobs and different sectors have changed um, over over the pandemic. And actually, some of the sectors that have seen the biggest increase are transport and logistics, um, fairly unsurprisingly, with online retail and, and home delivery, um, manufacturing, um, domestic help. Um, I'm sure relevant to this audience will be um, HR and recruitment, which I think is the number of vacancies in that sector is up about 70 percent. Um, far more than, than the economy as a whole. Um, however, we've actually seen recently a slight decline in graduate vacancies um, below pre-pandemic levels and also the, the legal sector. Um, another feature of this um, pre-pandemic jobs market is that workers are switching jobs faster than ever before. Um, so we've got a, a series on the left from the, uh, from the Office of National Statistics in the UK. This is looking at the number of workers that are moving from job to job. And um, this has hit a, a record um, since they began collecting this data in, in about 2001. Um, and you're seeing this around the world too. So on the right, we, we have the data from the US on the, on the quit rate. Um, and they found about 3% uh, of, of, of workers quit, quit their job in, um, in the last month for, for which there's, there's data available. Um, so this is a real reversal from what we saw earlier in the pandemic. Um, and there was, a, there was a sharp drop in the number of workers moving around. Um, as, as firms stopped hiring, and also perhaps workers uh, sort of sought that, that security of, of uh, continuous uh, continuous employment. Um, so this this shortage, um, um, this fall in so we've seen a fall in labour supply, and the rise in labour demand, um, and this is creating problems for firms. Um, so in our most recent CFO survey, which I mentioned at the start of the presentation, um, almost half of firms said they're seeing significant or severe levels of recruitment difficulties. Um, and of those, around about half of them, so a quarter of all firms, um, are expecting this still to be um, a feature uh, in, in 12 months' time. Um, so it's creating problems for firms, um, booms for recruiters. Um, so you know, there's been, been reports in the press, which I've been seeing, um, you know, recruiters are, are busier than ever. And actually, recruiters themselves are now, are now struggling to find, um, or to find recruiters. They, they, they themselves are, are, are experiencing labor shortages, which I'm, I'm sure some of you will have, um, have some experience of. Um, so, um, you know, as economists, we have supply, demand, and then and then price. Um, and what we've um, you know, what, what we've seen in terms of wages uh, throughout this uh, pandemic is at the beginning of the pandemic um, there was a sharp drop in, in levels of average earnings. Um, and this data is slightly difficult to interpret because it's not um, it's not earnings per hour, but it's, it's weekly earnings. So at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, people cut their hours, people went on furlough. Um, this resulted in a real drop in earnings. Um, and then as people came off furlough, they increased their hours, their overall earnings increased. Um, and so you see this very sort of sharp spike um, in the graph um, on the left. The most recent data that we have for earnings these effects have largely dropped out. So when we are comparing um, earnings in the most, the most recent month um, to a year ago, we're not comparing it with that sort of extraordinary period where uh, people did cut their, cut their hours and earnings and significant numbers of people um, were on furlough. Um, and so for the most, um, the most recent data, um, we've seen growth in regular earnings of, of close to 4%. Um, but as economists, um, we're always interested in, in real, um, real changes. So instead of nominal, so when, when economists talk about um, uh, the real change in, in earnings, um, we're accounting for the effect of inflation, which, as we know, is, is very high. So despite the fact that um, sort of headline growth in nominal earnings um, is at historical levels quite high, it's not enough to compensate for the effects of inflation. So overall, the value of, of people's wage packets and it's buying less goods and services um, than, it, than it did a, a few months ago. Um, and this is going to uh, feed into you know, what, what some in the press are calling the cost of living crisis. Um, 
So I've got some analysis here, which I, I borrow from the uh, Tony Blair Institute. Um, and this is looking at um, the impact um, of various tax benefits um, and uh, tax and benefit changes, and also the rise in, in energy bills um, uh, across households on the, the income distribution. So um, the bar on the left, so that's the poorest 10% of, of households, um, and the bar second from the right um, is the richest 10% of households. Um, and you can see that for the poorest in, in society, um, there's a real hit uh, to their incomes um, from the rising cost of energy, um, and that's not off offset by rises in the minimum wage um, or rises in benefits. Um, so against this backdrop um, of you know, rising cost of living, the fact that uh, regular uh, real pay is not um, is not keeping up with inflation um, is, is a concern um, and is likely to be a, a big political issue in, 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 the, in the year to come. Um, so I appreciate we're sort of um, running a little bit on time. It'd be great to, to, to move on to some questions. Um, so as economists, how do we sort of tackle this problem? Um, and the answer is to boost productivity. So instead of working, um, working harder, we work uh, smarter. Um, and what we saw um, since the financial crisis is that much of the growth in GDP has come because we're working more hours um, and not because we're doing more um, with the hours that we work. Um, how do we boost productivity? Uh, well, part of the answer might be uh, more investment, which has been very weak um, since the global financial crisis. Um, our CFO survey found that businesses um, are placing greater priority on investment than at any time since at least um, 2009. Um, and particular prioritizing investments in digital and also looking to invest um, in workplace uh, work, workforce skills, um, retraining um, and, and upskilling. Um, so um, some very, very quick conclusions. And so um, the downturn was not as deep as we feared. Um, we're hoping that inflation and supply chain disruption will start to ease in the second half of this year. Um, businesses are positioning for growth. Um, We've seen a fall in labour supply and a rise in labour demand, um, and this is feeding through to wage, wage pressures. Um, however, there are groups on the edge of the workforce who could um, who could try and draw back into the labour market, um, and this would this would boost the supply. Um, and finally, a few risks uh, that we're thinking about a year ahead. Um, so one is that we have yet another variant. Um, there is a, a school of thought um, among epidemiologists that over time variants become um, more easily transmissible, um, but less uh, less virulent, so less likely to cause um, severe disease. Um, you know, this this is certainly uh, this would be a very desirable outcome, um, but by no means no means assured. Um, inflation continues to be um, to be a risk. I think if inflation does continue um, to be higher than we're expecting, we'll see central banks moving their raise interest rates, um, and actually the, the the global financial system. Has been very used to low interest rates for a long time, um, and this could this could generate uh, some some instability. Um, labour shortages identified by um, the CFOs in our CFO survey as the top risk facing businesses. Um, there's also the risk of, of geopolitics. Um, we're seeing a lot of tension in that area at the minute. Um, and finally, looking at the global economy, um, we are somewhat concerned about slowing growth in China. Um, you may have read something about the, uh, the problems in the real estate sector over there. Um, and also, the demographics of China are of an aging population. Um, so the engine of growth that we've seen China being over the last 10 years um, may, be, may be starting to slow. Um, and with that, I will, um, I, will, I will finish the presentation and hopefully have time for one or two um, quick questions. Peter, I can sort of come in and say that was such a good overview of, you know, everything that's happened, why it's happened, and sort of the opportunities. You know, from a recruiter point of view, all of that really sort of sees lots of change again, but change where last year we're perhaps going in a little bit dark, not showing, not sure how it's going to go. And I think it all surprised us all. But this year, I think you're, I'm taking from that, we've got a positive outlook. It's going to give us a lot of change while we're going, but businesses are reinvesting and we're looking to grow. So that's great from the recruiter, recruiter's market. So, you know, just, um, I can't see any of the questions coming in. I know it's a lot of information for everybody to digest, but from my perspective, how I was growing my business, which I know that all our audience is doing that, <clears throat> it's a really good year to invest, some automation, some technology, et cetera, as well to make smarter, but also to look at um, 
let's not just jump back and help our clients jump back to the way it was. Let's look at tapping into that flexibility and different ways to get more candidates into those jobs. And hence then more placements and more, more jobs filled because that's what uh, our industry is really focused on. So lots of opportunity this year. Would you agree? Yeah, I think I think I would certainly agree with that. And you know, certainly when we saw the news about Omicron breaking, um, we were very concerned we were going to see you know drop in confidence among um, among businesses. Um, and again, a sort of retreat into the more defensive stance of you know focusing on cost control. Um, but actually, um, we've not seen that at all. Um, we've seen businesses positioning for growth. Um, they're looking to invest. Um, they're looking they're looking to grow. Um, and certainly, I think they're more worried now about whether or not. Um, you know, they'll be able to make uh, the recruitment decisions that they need um, to support that growth um, and the investments um, that, that they need as well. So, um, yeah, certainly among the CFOs we're seeing, focus has, has shifted away from sort of worrying about demand for their businesses. They're seeing strong demand um, to think about how they can how they can take advantage of that. And I was quite interested in that sort of um, mention of China, that driving force sort of going, you know, I'm not as as savvy in terms of obviously global sort of impacts, but <clears throat> you know, do you see what's going to replace China, or do you, you know how are you looking at that in terms of what impacts they're going to have in the UK? Do you have any insights on that? Um, yeah, certainly. So um, I think I think it's not so much. Um, yeah, there's a question of, uh, yeah, of, of yeah. So over the last sort of ten years, we've seen a lot of growth in the global economy as a whole, coming from China. Um, it's a country that's seen you know, very fast uh, levels of growth, um, focused on um, focused on investment, um, and that has started to slow for, for a number of reasons, which I which I touched upon. Um, so I think the question is, is is where do you see you know growth in in, in the world kind of mm-hmm. economy um, starting to come from? Um, and certainly there are um, you know, there's, there's 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 signs that advanced economies um, may be shifting, um, you know, are shifting towards growth. Um, but also, you know, it is worth thinking about other um, sort of middle-income countries um, that are starting to um, starting to move. And actually, um, some of these countries are quite well positioned um, with some of the, the worries about supply chains, um, and also that you know, we see the tensions between the US and China um, around having that diversity in, in your supply chains as well. Um, that the companies are looking to either sort of nearshore some of their some of their operations. Reshoring, moving some of the operations back to their back to their home countries, um, or getting diversity. So looking at um, opening plants in places like Vietnam and, and, and Southeast Asia, they've got a little bit more um, resilience and, and redundancy. Um, the caveat, I would say, with, with all of that um, is that shifting supply chains is actually a very slow process. Yeah. So it's more a process I think that we're going to see taking place over um, three to five years, um, rather than you know in in, in, in a matter of months. That's really interesting as well. And that gives you, um, I know that will give our audience lots of topics of conversation as well to be having with hiring managers, because those business problems then equate to new jobs getting created as to how we do that and how how they're wanting to manoeuvre. So, um, yeah, really interesting point as well. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for joining us and giving us that overview. I always think it's a really good thing to be able to look at from a business owner's point of view at the start of the year. So I really appreciate that. <clears throat> um, I think um, Andrew sort of posted out um, some links there to some of those surveys, etc. And again, if you would like those slides, please get in contact. I'm sure we're going to be able to, to share some of those slides with you as well. Um, best place to get in contact with you if anybody's got any questions. Is it your LinkedIn profile or anything else? Yeah, po- probably just drop me um, drop me an email. It's, uh, my, my email address is on the Deloitte website or it's at right. Deloitte.co.uk. Nice and easy. So that's poss- that's brilliant. And Andrea, again, can post that. You can get that through us as well. So thank you so much for spending that time. I know your time is very valuable. Um, and to all the audience, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope that gave you some really good insight as well. Um, on our February Crowdcast, next up, we've got uh, Alison Humphrey. So those that know um, Alison, she's going to be coming in and we're going to be looking at developing that talent, coaching, etc. on that topic too. So make sure you sign in for our February um, a February show as well, which I know will be exciting as well. And any other topics you want me to look at, I think we're booked up March and April, but beyond that, we'll be looking for some topics that um, are relevant to you and bringing that to you all um, to to be able to sort of tune in and learn. But thank you very much. I hope you've started to have a great 2022 and look forward to supporting you going forward. Peter, thank you again.